Good afternoon. Welcome to the third and final of the 2010 Prather Lectures. I'm Jonathan Lossis, Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology here at Harvard. I know many of you have been to one or both of the previous talks, so I won't uh, go over the same ground as the previous introductions. Rather, I'd like to talk about two aspects of Ed's career that haven't yet been mentioned. The first one is, is somewhat, uh, the first one is Ed Wilson, the educator. And this one to me is very personal because 30 years ago, I arrived here at Harvard <laughs> as a callow youth with very vague, ill-formed ideas about evolution and biodiversity. And on my very first morning of classes here, I sat in this very lecture hall in the front row, as I will be sitting today, to take the core course, Science B15, Evolutionary Biology, taught by none other than Edward O. Wilson. And as you may imagine, uh, this course was a brilliant synthesis of evolutionary biology and biodiver biodiversity, and it was captivating. And it was so captivating that every year in the 18-year run of this course, Ed filled this lecture hall with undergraduates. It was one of the most highly rated courses among the students. And this course had a, a very great effect on my own development. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that because of that course, I've, I have followed the course that I have and I'm here today. And in fact, I can tell you, I know that I am not the only student who took uh, Science B15 or served as a TF who is in the audience today. Many others were similar, similarly affected by this course. It has had a great impact on many people who have either become scientists or at least have a great appreciation both for evolutionary biology and biodiversity. And I can tell you it's a great thrill to be back in this lecture hall again, seated in the front row, and soaking up the wisdom and insight of Professor Wilson. Now, my second point concerns the books that Ed has written, and we've heard about a number of them. Um, I just want to, as an aside, mention Ed's most recent book, Ant Hill, his first novel, and I just want to tell you that I'm three quarters of the way through it, and it's a, it's a great book, it's a great novel, and I highly recommend it. Um, if you don't believe me, Check out the review in the New York Review of Books two weeks ago by Margaret Atwood, or pick up the New York Times on Sunday, where it will be reviewed by Barbara Kingsolver, and you'll see the book is getting great reviews, and it's well worth reading. But that is not, despite that plug, that is not the book that I wanted to talk about. The book I want to talk about is one that has not yet been mentioned. It's Ed's bio autobiography, Naturalist, published in 1994. And this is a book that I highly recommend to all of my students for two reasons. The first is that it lays out Ed's remarkable career as a scientist. I'm sure that all of us in this room, to some extent, have an appreciation of what an incredible career Ed Wilson has had. But at least for me, it was not until I read this book that I fully appreciated the magnitude of the contributions he has made to science and to society. And so I, I just want to briefly tell you what I got out of reading this book, that in addition to becoming the world's leading authority on ants, Ed has played a major role in the following contributions in our field. The uh, discovery of the role of pheromones in ant communication, the development of the theory of island biogeography, the study of the evolution of eusociality in insects, sociobiology, basically creating the field of conservation biology, and advancing our understanding of the evolution of human culture. Now, I think most people in this room, most scientists, if at the end of their career could claim any single accomplishment like one of these lists, we would be very satisfied that it was a career to be proud of. The fact that Ed has had all of these contributions is really truly remarkable and humbling. Now, I recommend this book to this audience for a second reason, however. It provides a gripping historical narrative of the development of biology here at Harvard from the time of the discovery of DNA to the resurgence of organismal biology. As many of you know, the latter half of the last century was a tumultuous time in, in biology, both across the country and very particularly here at Harvard. And if you'd like to read a, a wonderful history of the development of the field, and particularly here at Harvard with some great stories, uh, this is the place to go. And in fact, if you want to understand how we here at, in the biological community at Harvard have gotten where we are, this book really is a must read. Well, as I said, Naturalist was written in 1994, and Ed has hardly sat on his laurels since then. In fact, in the 
in the 16 years since then, Ed has published seven further books and has de developed a number of additional important ideas, such as the concept of biophilia, the biophilia hypothesis, as well as forging the rapprochement between the evangelical Christians and the environmental movement towards protecting biological diversity. In his talk today, Ed is going to talk about the subject of another one of his books and another of his important ideas, that of consilience, the concept, uh, the concept of bridging the gap between the humanities and the scientists. Ed, it is a great honor to have you here as the Prather Lecturer for 2010. And it's a great honor to be introduced by you, Jonathan. You, know, you are carrying the banner high here at Harvard. Um, okay, now we're back to the first slide that I'm going to be showing. Tonight I'm going to talk about what I consider to be um, a new frontier in science. Uh, but equally a new frontier in the social sciences and humanities. And of course, this is a controversial notion, but that's what Harvard is supposed to be all about. <laughs> Although it's widely assumed that there are many ways to account for the human condition, in fact, there are only two ways to account for the human condition. The first comes from the natural sciences whose practitioners set out more than four centuries ago and with considerable success to understand how the material world works. And all will agree they preempted that particular enterprise. The second way to account for the human condition is all the other ways. <laughs> Since the 18th century, the great branches of learning have been classified into the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. Today, we have the choice between, on the one hand, trying to make the great branches of learning conciliant, that is, coherent, and interconnected by cause and effect explanation, or on the other hand, not trying to make them conciliant. Surely, universal conciliance is worth a serious try. After all, the brain, mind, and culture are composed of material entities and processes. They do not exist in an astral plane above and outside the tangible world. The most con useful term to capture the unity of knowledge is surely consilience. It means the interlocking of cause and effect explanations across different disciplines as, for example, between physics and chemistry, and biology, and more controversially, of course, biology and the social sciences. The word consilience was introduced in 1840 by William Hewell, the founder of the modern philosophy of science. It's more serviceable than words like coherence or interconnectedness because its rarity of usage since 1840 has preserved its original meaning, whereas coherent, coherence and interconnectedness have acquired many meanings scattered among the different disciplines. Consilience, defined then as cause and effect explanations across the disciplines has plenty of credibility. It's the mother's milk of the natural sciences. It's material understanding, of how the world works and its technological spin-off are the foundation of modern civilization. The time has come, I believe, to consider more seriously that its relevance to the science, social sciences, and the humanities. Now, I'll grant immediately that belief in the possibility of consilience beyond the natural sciences and across the other the great branches of learning is not the same as science, at least not yet. It is a metaphysical worldview and a minority one at that shared by only scientists and a few philosophers. Its best support is little more than an extrapolation of the consistent past success of the natural sciences. Its strongest appeal is in the prospect of intellectual adventure. And given enough modest success, the value of understanding the human condition with a higher degree of certainty. Now, I believe that it's a matter of practical urgency also to focus on the unity of knowledge, and let me illustrate that claim 
with an example. Uh, as shown here, think of two intersecting lines that form a cross and picture the four quadrants uh, that are thus created. Label one quadrant environmental policy, uh, the next ethics, uh, and um, the next biology, uh, the next biology, and the final one, social science. Uh, well, I've got, well, I got ahead of myself. Let me see if I can go back. Um, there we go. Uh, at any rate, continuing on, each of these subjects then, I just listed them and there they are, uh, has its own experts, its own language, its rules of evidence, its criteria of validation, its many endowed professorships at Harvard. <laughs> now, if we, uh, now if we focus uh, on more specific subjects, as noted here, Within each of the quadrants, we see how general theory translates into the analysis of practical problems. And we understand that in each case, we somehow have to learn how to travel as clockwise um, uh, from one subject to the next. In a single discussion, maybe in a sentence or two in the discussion, it's necessary to travel the entire circuit. Now move through concentric circles toward the intersection of the disciplines. As we approach the intersection where most real world problems exist, the circuit becomes more difficult, the process more disorienting and contentious. The nub of the problem, I suggest vexing a great deal of human thought is the general belief that a fault line exists between the natural sciences on one side and the humanities and humanistic social sciences on the other. In other words, very roughly between the scientific and literary cultures as defined by C.P. Snow in his famous 1959 Reed Lecture. The solution to the problem, I believe, is the recognition that this boundary is not a fault line, it is not a permanent epistemological division, it is not a Hadrian's wall, as many would have it, needed to protect high culture from the reductionist barbarians of science. <laughs> what we are beginning at last to understand is that this line does not exist at all. It is instead a broad domain of poorly understood material phenomena awaiting cooperative exploration from both sides to the ultimate benefit of all, each of the great branches of learning. During the past several decades, um, several, dec several borderland disciplines, hmm. you know, like the mind of an overly bright and eager Harvard undergraduate, this machine is, seems to be racing ahead of my. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that at those noontime lectures um, that were mentioned uh, by my introducer, um, my problem was to make the talk interesting enough to keep them from picking up that morning's issue of the Crimson. <laughs> any rate, um, the borderland disciplines, uh, we're back to them. Uh, and I think this is self-explanatory. Most of you will be familiar with these as intermediate disciplines, and they, they themselves are synthetic in nature, drawing from several uh, preceding and better established disciplines. And uh, from the social sciences side, in this cooperative effort of exploring the borderland, uh, the um, social sciences are providing or moving with cognitive psychology and biological anthropology and biological investigations of the foundation of political and economic behavior 
which are beginning to take hold. To an increasing degree, cognitive psychology and biological anthropology are becoming consilient, for example, with the four disciplines shown on the slide. And in fact, they're anathemosing with them in cause and effect explanation. Other disciplines have begun a cautious entry, including even literary criticism, which is beginning to stir up troubles along the borderland in the home uh, land, uh, countries. Um, now, and these connections are strengthening very rapidly. Uh, and um, as, as we saw, for example, in the race to uh, map the human, human genome, uh, there was, it was autocatalytic. And one advances uh, promoted still more rapid and, and, a, and, and a spray of other advances and so on. So let me then pass to the key question, why is this import, this conjunction among the great branches of learning important? Because it offers the prospect of characterizing human nature with greater objectivity and precision an exactitude that is the key to human self-understanding. The intuitive grasp of human nature has been the substance of the creative arts. It's been the underpinning of the social sciences um, and of the um, a beckoning mystery to the natural sciences. To grasp human nature objectively, to explore it to its depths scientifically, and to grasp its ramifications would be to approach, if not at last attain the grail of scholarship, to fulfill the dreams of the enlightened, which failed and stumbled and failed so pitifully uh, before romanticism and uh, the lack of sufficient evidence in the early 1800s. Now, rather than let the matter hang, in the air, rhetorically, I want to suggest a preliminary definition of human nature and then illustrate it with examines, examples. Human nature is not the genes which prescribe it. It is not the cultural universal, such as the incest taboos and the rites of passage that are the products of human nature. Rather, human nature uh, is the epigenetic rules the inherited regularities of mental development. These rules are the genetic biases and the way our senses perceive the world, the symbolic coding by which we represent the world, the options we open to ourselves and the responses we find easiest and most rewarding to make in ways that are beginning to come into focus at the physiological and even in a few cases the genetic level. The epigenetic rules alter the way we see and linguistically classify color. They cause us to evaluate the aesthetics of artistic design according to elementary abstract shapes and the degree of complexity in them. They lead us differentially to acquire certain fears and phobias concerning dangers in the environment as from snakes and heights, to communicate with certain facial, uh, facial expressions and forms of body language, to bond with infants, to bond conjugally, and so on across a wide range of categories and behavior and thought. Most are evidently ancient, dating back millions of years in mammalian ancestry, and others like the stages of linguistic development are uniquely human and probably only hundreds of thousands of years old. Let me now spell out um, the, uh, several of the examples that I, in fact, alluded to briefly. Uh, when you take a Munsell array, as, as, as a standard color array, left to right uh, across different frequencies of light, uh, up and down or down to uh, up to down uh, in um, intensity, uh, then ask the native language speakers to place their color terms on the Munsell array. You know, what does azul, where does it fit? Where does scarlet fit? And so on. Uh, then you get this, a clustering 
on uh, certain parts of the muscle array. And that clustering occurs in those areas uh, where uh, the um, change of perception, as we ha have a uniform velocity of change in light, uh, the, uh, uh, the wavelength of the light, uh, then uh, where the perception speeds up uh, in, pers uh, in, in, in its uh, ability to judge it uh, is uh, where people put the fewest, or more le most least likely to um, place uh, their term. And where it slows down, even though that is not really what's happening in the muscle array as we see it in the visual cortex, where it slows down uh, is um, where we place the color terms. This has been done with some 20 uh, in classic experiments with some 20 uh, languages, native language speakers. Um, interestingly enough, yes, interestingly enough, it has also been found, although this is an area that's in rapid uh, change, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in def definement, uh, defining uh, of, of uh, the analysis and so on. But I think what I'm about to tell you is generally true, that as terms are invented by cultures, going from culture to culture, uh, comparing uh, cultures with different numbers of color terms, from those like the Dani of New Guinea with two terms to uh, those in the European cultures with 11. There being 11 uh, terms which are inter, are translatable, that is interchangeable, one on one, one on many, or one on many, or many on one, 11 that are translated like this along in all known color terminologies. Um, and this is the, uh, this is the um, consistent evolution that you can see by comparing one society after another. This is a skittery computer. At any rate, uh, one on, um, uh, by comparing cultures uh, with different numbers of terms, then we get this sequence. Two terms, it's black and white. Three, black, white, red. Four, then they have black, white, red, and green or yellow, and so on. Now, what's interesting about that is that there are <laughs> Whenever things go wrong in another university or college and I'm lecturing something like this, I always say Harvard technology. <laughs> <laughs> any rate, um, well, any rate, the point here is that um, there are 2,036 possible ways to uh, create a sequence with 11 terms uh, with increasing numbers of terms in the set. But <clears throat> in fact, only 22 are actually followed, or close to 22 are followed. So there's something going on here that I don't think is yet fully understood. <clears throat> As a second example of epigenetic rules, consider the instinct to avoid incest. This key element now, and this seems to be well documented, is the Westermark effect, named after uh, Edward Westermark, the Finnish anthropologist who discovered it more than a century ago. And it is simple. When two people live together in close domestic proximity during the first 30 months in the life of either one, both are desensitized. A switch is turned off. In other words, a circuit is blocked. Desensitized to later close sexual attraction and bonding in the other person. The Westermark effect has been well documented in anthropological studies, especially in 
in Israel kibbutzim and in the Simpua marriage systems of older China. Although the genetic uh, prescription and the neurobiological mechanisms that underlie it uh, remain uh, unexplored to the most extent. What makes the human evidence the more convincing is that all of the non-human primates whose sexual behavior has been closely studied also display the Western mark effect. It therefore seems probable that the trait, and that's different from what's used by most other animals, uh, in avoiding incest, a different mechanism than in plants, of course, as well. Uh, what, um, it seems probable that this is a trait <coughs> that was in the human ancestral line millions of years before the origin of our own species. And of course, without going into detail, the existence of the Western Mark effect uh, runs directly counter to the more widely known and romantic and exciting uh, Freudian theory of incest avoidance, which being failed, a failed hypothesis, uh, will receive no more attention tonight from me. <laughs> <coughs> In another wholly different realm, consider the basis of aesthetic judgment. Neurobiological monitoring, in particular measurements of the damping <clears throat> pardon me, of the alpha wave, that is uh, damping of, that is uh, damping of the alpha wave, <coughs> pardon me, uh, is a measure of the um, calming of the, the total uh, brain system. <clears throat> Measurements of damping of alpha wave during presenta presentations of abstract designs as shown here, um, <clears throat> has shown that the brain is most aroused by patterns in which there is roughly a 20% redundancy of elements, or put very roughly, the amount of complexity found in a simple maze or two turns of a logarithmic spiral or in an asymmetric cross. And uh, of these three arbitrarily chosen designs <clears throat> for left to right increasing complexity, you're, you are most aroused, whether you will admit it or not, or know it or not, by the one in the middle. It may be a coincidence that <clears throat> about the same property is shared by a great deal of art in friezes, grill work, colophons, logographs, and flag design. It crops up again in the glyphs of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, as well as in the pictographs of modern Asian language. Here is an example in um, an issue of Daedalus some time ago on the brain. The artist was uh, asked to depict a, um, a brain in abstract design, and uh, there you have it, uh, the ideal level of, uh, for arousal of the design. But this is just one of many, many uh, examples. Here we have standard Japanese print uh, and, and uh, ideograms which show the same principle. And